Welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage. I'm here to give you a front row seat to the Emmys, Oscars, SAG, and Tony's races. Who is in the running? What makes an award-worthy performance? And what are the secrets to giving one? These intimate, inspirational conversations with some of today's most talented stars provide you, dear listener, the kind of craft and career advice that could win you a statue of your own, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I think it's also in an actor's nature to wonder, well, what's next? You know, even you get totally. some, a job on anything, on a, you know, a play or a commercial or something like, what's well, what's next? Because this is right. this is cool now, but I, you know, this is going to be done in about a week. Jamie, are you there? I am. Hello. Hi. Hi, what's going on? I'm good, I'm good. How is the snow? Oh, it's just wonderful. I bet you miss it terribly. I really (laughs) don't. What are you doing? I'm currently in my booth and my house, Uh and uh, it's freezing cold outside, and I'm a little (laughs) bit jealous of you in LA, to be perfectly honest. (laughs) What are you doing? Well, um, I'm here at at Tim's in Soundbox LA. Shout out to Soundbox LA. Yeah. uh, With Cho just outside, my faithful companion in the recording studio. Should we talk about Paul Rudd? Why not? Yeah, he's both a huge movie star with like a very handsome smile, but also like he just came in here and he was a super chill, regular kind of dude. He was super, super nice. Yeah. He was talking about the comfort in his performance and uh, how important that is. Mm. And I just get the sense that Mm. he's never, ever stressed about anything. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Yeah, what's his secret? What's his secret? That's what we want to know. Maybe that's why he looks so young. He never gets stressed about anything. <laughs> totally. Totally. I noticed he's kind of off social media. We actually didn't really even talk that much about his role in the Avengers movies. Mm. Uh, although he certainly is in the highest grossing movie of all time, Avengers Endgame, which came out this year. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> and could very well be nominated for a bunch of awards. Um, and we we mostly were here to talk about uh, his new Netflix show, Living With Yourself. Yeah. Which, what a great show to talk about an actor on this podcast because he's acting opposite himself, not unlike the other friend of the podcast, who you love. Tatiana. (laughs) Tatiana Maslany. (laughs) It reminded me of that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That same idea. The filming process and, you know, having to divide your brain into multiple parts to to produce this thing. Yeah. Totally. There were some really, really specific, intricate tricks of the trade of how to do that. Yeah, that's right. It was fascinating to, to learn how they do that process with yeah. stand-ins and without stand-ins. This is a great interview. Um, anything else we got to say about Paul Rudd before we get to a quick break and then his biography? <sighs> I mean, you could have asked about his like skincare regime or something, but you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is such a not a visual medium. However, I did capture a photo with Paul Rudd where I just, uh, yeah, my skincare routine looks pretty crappy next to his, I got to say. <laughs> It's well, humbling to take a photo with Paul Rudd. We but... can't all be movie stars, can we? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's really a movie star. And hey, listeners who are not following us on social media, you can find that photo at In the Envelope on Twitter or at our Facebook page at In the Envelope. Uh, please follow us there. And if you're joining us for the first time, <laughs> because. This is our first interview with a giant superhero. Welcome. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here, in this very episode and use it, go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices and start applying to jobs because who knows, maybe one day I'll be interviewing you. 
Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. Actor, screenwriter, producer, and philanthropist Paul Rudd is known for his breakout in the 1995 classic Clueless, his comedy hit collaborations with Judd Apatow, and his hilarious work on Friends, Wet Hot American Summer, and more, although he's probably best known in Marvel's Avengers franchise as Scott Lang in Ant-Man and its sequel, which he co-wrote. The Kansas City native now stars opposite his cloned self in Netflix's new comedy from Timothy Greenberg, Living With Yourself. Here he is, the brilliant Paul Rudd. Um, Rhinebeck is where you live. Rhinebeck. Interesting. Is, yeah. I just moved from New York City here. Oh, oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> How long ago? <laughs> Two weeks ago. Oh, my God. Two and a half weeks ago, yeah. Oh, wow. So you're real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's... I really, yeah. It's been a lot. How uh, hit the ground running? Yeah. So. Well, I mean, my gosh, here we are. You're already up and doing this, and that, and you've been here for two weeks. Yeah. How are you finding yes. it? Um, it's it's good. I have I have nothing resembling a routine, so I feel like I don't I don't know. Well, yeah, I think that's you know what you, that's yeah. after two weeks, I'd be surprised if yeah. you. I always that's feel close. like I think that it takes two years for anybody okay. to feel like they live in any place. Two years. Two years. Two years. Well, that's good you'll be to fine. Know. You'll be fine. You'll <laughs> yeah. enjoy yourself. You'll sure, sure, be sure. happy here. I'm. A, I'm. Uh, uh, but I'm assuming. But yeah. uh, you won't feel like you really live here for two years. That's uh, there. We go. Everything is two years, I'll by the way. In two years. I think. What do you mean everything? I. I think everything is two years mm. for it, everything to just kind of make sense. Hmm. I remember when my dad died, a friend of mine, I had dinner with a friend of mine a week later, and he said, you're going to be sad for two years. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, after two years, you'll be able to think of your dad, and you won't be sad. You'll be happy. And I found that that was kind of, I think that might have been true. And I have moved to different places throughout mm-hmm. my life, and it's always been two years. That's so interesting. I wonder if there's a, a two year psychological thing? component. Yeah. Well, they say that I about Los Angeles, it. that it takes 20 minutes, right, to get everywhere, <laughs> but two years for you to feel like you're a, a, a real local. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us on Backstages in the Envelope podcast. Are you familiar with Backstage? Did you ever use Backstage? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Did you? Oh, sure. Ah! For what? Like auditions? Uh, just, yeah, just reading. You know, I got out of acting school. It was, that yes. was, but I go back, I go back very far to like drama log years. Okay. And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but backstage for sure. And I think you know, in New York, it's a uh, certainly it's the thing. Yeah. 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 Did you go out for like commercials? Was it plays? Plays mainly, okay. and you know, uh, and then just uh, just to read and find out what's going on. Yeah. Good. I mean, you know, this is this, this is, the... is I'm a fossil. This was pre. Uh, You're not a fossil. I'm a fossil. <laughs> but this is like kind of pre. Um, uh, even you know social media, internet, and all this sure. stuff. You know, I think there were we were, we relied on yeah. Um, yeah on the trades, the trade publications. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you went to Bada. I did. I went to Bada too. You did. <laughs> yes. How, I want to ask you about it. Oh, great! Yeah. It was great. I mean, I it's really set me on a path. Did it? It's like, was it influential for you? Was it? Like I loved a, it. Yeah. yeah. I, I went to. I went. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts for proper. For, so I went to right. a, Ada, Ada, yeah. and then I went to England for Bada. Okay. There's Rada and there's yeah. Lambda, which are not really. Yeah. 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 Um. I loved it. I loved yeah. being, um, in Oxford, and I loved staying mm. in these. You know. I I was at Balliol College and I was thinking, wow, you know, Aldous Huxley lived here. Yeah, cool. And uh, and working on classical text and Jacobean drama and all of these, Mm. you know, and being there working on it, it was incredible. Yeah. Did you find that to be the case? Yes, yes, uh, totally. And I wonder, (laughs) is Jacobean drama, does that have anything to do with now? Like what carried over? What do you still use? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, ultimately... It's all the same thing, really. Mm, sure. There are certain rules I don't have to follow, such as uh, penta- iambic pentameter, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah. Um, hmm. but you know, it's you're you're hopefully trying to talk to Tell and the ca- truth. connect to whoever it is you're acting opposite, sure. and uh, 
you know, and, and it just happens that a lot of that text is the mm. best stuff. But yeah, um, it is a, it is a bit of a, a jump to go from, you know, tis pity she's a whore to anchorman. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd be really curious to know the overlaps between that. But I like this idea. It's it's building blocks that you're learning in different ways, basically. Mm. In a different mm. different context and it helps to be in a completely different context like England. Right. And like Well, I think that there's something, you know, when you're an an actor or you or you move to Los Angeles or to New yeah. York or to be an actor, it's all such an overwhelming thing. It's a mm. um you can feel completely alone in the uh journey of it all i don't know i mean you're two weeks in here i mean you're you're you're, you're, you're well on your you know you're, here, you're doing a lot more than just kind of showing up but <laughs> right um off the bus however um i think working on plays that are hundreds of years old and being in that setting being it um y- you feel a part of something that is huge I think some I think actors sometimes feel this living in New York and they're doing theater in New York. You feel a part of something that's much bigger than you that has history that has um importance and in a way that's I think makes people feel a little more sane wow. and a little bit more a part of something that's uh noble and and hmm. artistic and amazing because otherwise it can be very isolating. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When you have the, especially with the dream of the, for example, moving to L.A. to to become a movie star or X, Y, Z. Well, it's a weird thing. You know, people move here. I moved here. I've lived in New York for the last 20-something years. But I, I, you know, before I lived in New York, I lived here for about five years. And I went to acting school out here. Mm. And oh, okay. But I moved here from the Midwest. And mm-hmm. I was lucky that I came out here and I had a school to go to. I mean, my goals and aspirations were the same as I think many people, which is they mm-hmm. move here to study and then they want to become an actor. Mm-hmm. And um, I was fortunate because when I got here, I had a place that I needed to be. Yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of people come here and there isn't a place they're needed to sure. be. And yeah, that yeah. is... And you can't make a plan or it's harder to make a plan. You just have to carve your own right. way. You know, you were talking right. about routine. You haven't found your routine yet. Totally. Routines are crucial. Yes. I mean, we Structure. need them. We really need them. Yes. Uh, as human beings. To be efficient. Yeah, totally. To ground yourself in some way. Otherwise, you know, yeah. it's a it's a weird thing when no one cares how late you sleep. Oh my God. <laughs> totally. Yes. <laughs> or when you don't have an office to go you to. You don't have an office to go to or a <laughs> job or someplace you need to be. It's important to be needed in places. And you can use mm. those things as though that's your that's your your anchor while yeah. you then go out and, you know, do find things. auditions or do yeah. whatever it is that you're the you're more wild card do. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's needed in places, which also implies like community. It's good to have people surrounded it's a, a crucial. You. you have yeah. to have that. Yeah, you yeah. have to have that. Otherwise, it's very lonely and overwhelming. And you need yeah. people to commiserate with. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's actually sort of what this podcast has kind of become. A, it's a little bit of a, like, we like hearing about the dark periods and the dry spells and the, we like commiserating. I yeah. Think, a little bit. Sure. So I think it's really comforting to for someone to hear from you that, it can be isolating and that it can be oh absolutely terrifying and it doesn't and it isn't like that goes away once you get your sag card okay <laughs> yeah it isn't like okay. that even once you know you <laughs> are work i mean you could be working even yeah somewhat steadily or you know it, and it can that it can still feel completely overwhelming yeah yeah, and you're, I think it's also in an actor's nature to wonder, well, what's next? You know, even you get totally. some, a job on anything on a, mm-hmm. you know, a play or a commercial or something like what's well, what's next? Because this is right. this is cool now. But I, you know, this is going to be done in about a week. <laughs> right. Just by nature of the fact there's no job security. Yeah. It's sort of like a profession that has a built in anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Bit. Built in anxiety, and you are supposed to remain kind of anxious to do the work. Sure. Oh, yeah. You got it because when we can talk about the process of like creating characters, but sometimes you got to harness that anxiety to create something. Yeah. It's, right? Uh, yeah. In school, sometimes I just had this flash of this image when you were saying that. And yeah. was, I had a teacher, and uh, um, he would. 
to really get students to try and get in touch with some painful memory or some experience or something. Sure. And I remember kids in our class just crying and he was really saying, good, go use that. And I and oh. think, and, and, uh, I was horrified even yeah. as a first year acting student thinking this guy's not qualified to be doing this. This isn't oh, okay. therapy. It didn't feel, no, I felt as if he was, I, I didn't think that he, he was, uh, uh, doing a good thing. Yeah. Protecting <laughs> th- his students. Yeah. I yeah, think yeah. he was, I think he was trying to want to get in touch with that anxiety when you're, when you're working in some way or, or, mm. or insecurities or fears or whatever mm. that way. I think, you know, we apply this to our work, but yeah, oftentimes I think you can get somebody who's trying to, uh, teach T- uh. <laughs> and, and quotes and, and they, and, totally. and, and mm. I, I, I feel bad for young actors that sometimes fall prey to that and think, oh, I'm supposed to be doing it like this and this. And, yeah. and it can really mess with people's heads. Yeah. Well, and there's something to be said for like tapping into that well and then it runs dry because you you hit it too hard. To, you, you dug up something that you can't get back into when you need it. I also think that some, you know, there are certain kinds of uh, traumas that people experience mm-hmm. that, you know, um, probably best dealt with through certain kinds of therapy Actual therapy than, you know, yeah. styles class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because acting can be therapeutic, but it has to be safe. You have to have boundaries, yeah. as with anything, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Which is tricky, especially, yeah, for young people who are, like, moving here to go to acting class in their first year. I just year remember and... thinking, what about, I wonder what their parents would say if they uh-huh. were able to look at yeah. what's happening in this classroom right now. It would look like abuse. Abuse. Yeah. 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 Which in a way, uh, well, in a way I think in, sometimes it is. Yeah. And that creates its own trauma, which then you can use. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're really just adding <laughs> tools to your toolbox. Yeah. The, the worst auditions ever are then fuel for like future auditions because it's like the fear of that. That's right. Actually, maybe it's not tools for your toolbox, or paints for your paint uh, box. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, we like that. We like that metaphor. <laughs> um, so Kansas City, but mm. you grew up kind of all over, but I mostly did. Kansas City. Yeah. When was it acting? Was it always acting? I think in some ways it was. Uh, I used to love listening i loved movies and Mm. comedians i used to listen to totally uh, i loved comics and stuff like that and i i've sometimes you know i tried to deconstruct why is it that i pursued this because no one in my family did this Mm -hmm. and i don't come from a showbiz family i don't know you know um i don't know whether or not it was that i was two years old and my sister was born and all of a sudden i wasn't the only show in town anymore and i thought you know i think i learned that uh, if I did some kind of cute dance or some little yeah. attention grabbing thing, my parents would notice me more than my sister and say, Hey, wait a minute, maybe there's something here. <laughs> so I don't know whether or not that was the genesis of it. Sure. Um, or it was just something over time. I started liking more and more. I think when I was in high school, junior high, maybe middle school, I, uh, I, yeah, I took like a public speaking class, a speech class in my oh, yeah. school and really liked it. And, then that turned into you know radio and TV class, and we had for it was called mm-hmm. forensics in Kansas, yes. Kansas City, like mm-hmm. kind of speech tournaments, and and I I really liked doing that. And then I did a couple of plays, and my next door neighbor said when I was about sixteen or seventeen, he said, "What do you uh, what do you think you want to do?" And mm-hmm. I said, "I'm not really sure." And he said, "Have you ever thought about acting? Because it seems like okay. that might be something you like." His son was an actor uh, in New York; he's a stage actor. Um, and I, I think that might have been a kind of a lightning bolt moment totally. for me because it seems as if, to me, at least mm-hmm. in my memory, that uh, from that point on, I thought, yep, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And I didn't really veer from it too much after that. Sure. Is there anything else you would do instead uh, if you had to forego all of this? I don't know. I think it would be... Uh, I used to really like to draw when I was... A mm-hmm. kid, and I thought maybe I wanted to go get into animation and that kind of thing. I don't think I would do that now. I don't think I could uh-huh. have done it ever, really. Uh, right. I don't think that was my calling. But um, when I think now, 
stuff that I, I would maybe like to do. I think building things, I think mm-hmm. carpentry, that kind of cr- creating something has always been, um, I think where my, my heart really yeah. is. And, and I like, cool. I like building stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, I, it is true. There's an interesting distinction between getting bit by the acting bug and wanting to act and then realizing it's a profession, like the career aspect of like, this is what I want to do to make money Yeah. Like to not to make money for the purpose of making money. But like, I want to do this as, as your, as your job, as a living. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. And, it, and to have that occur to you that it can be a job is like a big moment. I I used to love those Steve Martin records uh-huh. when I was a kid. They were really popular. Uh, and that was, I was little, but I loved Steve Martin and mm. I used to buy those records and, um, and I, I think that was the first time I thought, well, he's making a living talking. Mm. What an amazing <laughs> job that is to just yeah. to talk. Yeah. Not go to an office, but he just goes <laughs> wherever and he talks. And then he gets to tell jokes. He's, he says things and people laugh. Right. That, sound, that seems like a really nice way to <laughs> spend the day. So <laughs> right, uh, right. I, that was, huh. you know, those were, those were monumental moments yeah that i for for me and it's that and it's the attention the older brother thing <laughs> yeah i like that yeah too. well getting the last getting the you know yeah. getting the attention it and that changes i mean i think that i, th- I you know it, it it's it's not just about it's not attention seeking at a certain point i don't think i would hope not yeah maybe yeah well did you like what's <laughs> what was know. your what was your me well of, i i did act i did a lot of acting in high school um, a little bit in college, I, I definitely knew like theater or like storytelling in general was was my thing. Mm-hmm. But it was somewhat bada that was the turning point of like, oh, I re- I first and foremost really like writing, and is there a way to combine writing and theater or writing and the arts and maybe writing about those things would be the way to go. Mm-hmm. Dramatic criticism was something I studied and a lot in college, and then somehow lucked into. Uh, criticism veering into more reporting and more kind of what I do now, which is also then morphed into these interviews, which I find that my training as an actor and my training in all of the stuff around that is relevant. It yeah. is relevant. Even it's in, all kind of it tied all, together. It's that building blocks thing. It's the it's the idea of like we're always learning the same things. It's just a different context or a different teacher or a different talking about what it means to be a human being. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And trying to figure it out. In yes. Whatever medium, whether it's music or painting or acting or writing or yes. uh, whatever. And they're all really yeah. they're directing a, a scene or a play. or It's all, you know, you're shining a light on how uh, crazy it is to live. How to live. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How to live versus how to survive versus how to thrive. Like there's all these different levels of... Like storytelling, is, it's it's such a cliche, but it's like storytelling is really important. It's yeah, yeah. Oh what my you god, you do is is impactful. <laughs> you know, if we didn't have it, yeah, what, what would we do with our time? Yeah, maybe all storytelling is sort of like a form of education in a way. Well, everything that we know, you know, this uh, we're going. I'm thinking about. I'm here. I am. Listen to me. I'm thinking about Homer. Oh, not Simpson. Yes, but um, let's get super you know, highbrow. Yeah, no, but that was that was it with the Odyssey and, mm-hmm. and sitting around and telling these stories. Telling this, this is and the, yeah. the first things that we ever learned, right? Yeah. Well, I think it wasn't the Odyssey was kind of one of the first things somebody thought to write down. Maybe I think over a, a long period of time, and yeah. same with Iliad. Right? They were they yeah. were just writing down. I don't know this. I don't I know. know. The, I don't know the history here. I You're think I. Tr- I think I rem- uh, did at one point a little bit. <laughs> Same. But then they started to yeah write these stories. Were down. they sung? Were they chants? Oh, pro- probably. Probably. I just it was all a chant at that time. Yeah. There wasn't one guy named Homer, was that's there? That's how you. Or was there? I think that's up for debate. Yeah. Right. Maybe in the same way that Shakespeare's. One time I. Debate. One time I. Was um. I bought the Iliad. Mm-hmm just to as a just to read yeah i was in my 20s i was out of 
college and I thought, oh, I felt dumb. <laughs> and uh, I need to, re- I want to read some classic literature. So I, I was at a bookstore, I think it was like the Barnes and Noble or something. I bought the Iliad, which. <laughs> and read how much of it? I read the whole thing. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. But I, I remember this. I also did, at the time, I was doing a, uh, like a, like a juice fast. <laughs> Or is some kind of fast? I thought, uh, oh, people are doing these uh, these fasts, and I was so hungry, and I was reading the Iliad, oh. and I remember I was starving and thinking, if I have to read as Don appeared fresh and rosy fingered, yes. one more time, <laughs> I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna lose it. Was this in L.A. the juice fast? No, this oh. was in Kansas City. This oh, okay. was, but but around that time, I mean, I was. I was probably in my early twenties. I went and tried for yeah a few days. Or it might have been yeah. It was just I think I'd been reading all of these things about oh mm. man you got to try a you got to detoxify. Mm, mm. I tried to juice fast. I did it for a few days. I did the whole thing. Um, and it just happened. But it was and it was it. and I and I I mean trying to read the Iliad while you're doing it is a terrible <laughs> move. I also don't think it's a book that you... It, it isn't like, you know, picking up a regular book and reading a... On your own. Yeah. I feel like it's, it does have to be discussed in a classroom. Yeah. With other people. Yeah, there's... It, Maybe. <laughs> I think you're right. I don't know. That's certainly how I... Yeah, I love this idea of just like, I felt dumb. Yeah, it's not like... It's, well, it's not like... <laughs> it's, What's the cure It's not for quite like dumb? picking up, you know, a Hemingway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, so you had an exact moment in your life where you felt dumb and also like... You needed to detoxify. I wonder if they're related. Very, you know, probably. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. These were all, you know, if that was a, my your 20s or a, a, a discovery. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. And, uh, Trying on different things. Yeah. yeah. And feeling like um, a grown up in a way. Like, all right, I'm an, I'm an adult. Mm-hmm. I don't live at home. And I'm going to do you what know, I, I want. Like I have an, an idea. I was lucky. I knew what I wanted to do and I was trying to pursue it. But I, I was also really, you know asking myself the big questions yeah. and really like, figuring, trying to figure out yeah. what all of this was. Yeah. The big, who am I questions. Yeah. And what better, what better way to find out than <laughs> just have going to juice <laughs> cleanse and uh, <laughs> read Homer. <laughs> <laughs> and so what was then the, that was the trajectory you, you spent, how you went to LA and then you ended up in New York? I did. I went to, um, I, I moved I was at the University of Kansas. I was, a, I was, and I left to go to oh. uh, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts okay. h- here. The school was in Pasadena um, when I went, um, mm, okay. and, and so there are two two campuses. There's one in New York, and then there's one in California. Gotcha. And I was in California, and it was a two year school, two year program, and then I was here for for a few years. Mm-hmm. And I think that I always wanted to get to New York. Okay. Originally, I'm from the East Coast. Mm-hmm. I always liked it there. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted to do theater. Yeah. And theater is viable in New York in a way that it really isn't here. Sure. And yeah. uh, I, I, was, I was here for about five years and then I moved. Mm-hmm. And I've been in New York uh, ever since. And, and you was- still like the the theater do you go do you i do yeah you know, i mean um you're gonna do broadway I again i haven't been, i haven't been i'm i'm in a bit of a it's been too long since i've even been and seen a show there's about i have a list of ones i need to mm. see um it used to be that i was i would do a play a year for a long time yeah, awesome. pretty much but it's been a few years now mm-hmm. uh since i've done one and uh i it, it's great to do, I yeah. love I love doing it. Um, the eight shows a week is kind of <laughs> great. Actually, I don't mind the eight shows a week. It's the six days a week of work uh-huh. is a little tough, especially now because I have kids and I just yes. don't want to uh, be gone every night. And right. um, and that's I, I think that really more than anything is up, is what has prevented me from doing a play in a while. Yeah. No. Yeah. Do you consider the theater to be like a, is it a returning to a roots? Is it more or less challenging than the than the on-camera work? Or is it all kind of the same? Um, well, I think that it's, you know, it's a different experience. 
the experience itself is incredibly rewarding. There are many things I like about it. Mm -hmm. um, there's something, kind of going back to w w when we were saying feeling a part of something. When you're doing a play right. in New York City, you are a part of a community mm -hmm. and a part of New York City history that is really amazing yeah and it it's 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 great it's great to finish your show and then you go out for a dinner after mm -hmm. your play and you run into somebody else who's doing an, you know a, another show they had to go tonight how you know totally well, and and that is that's awesome yeah that that aspect of it being on stage and uh <laughs> knowing that like once this thing's starts and you have to just keep going and you're in a theater with 1500 people or what yeah. thousand but it's incredible yeah it really is a real um it's an experience that's very different than working on a movie because it's all happening in front of your face <laughs> yes. you're you know the audience is a huge part of the show mm -hmm. um yeah. and there's this amazing thing that can happen in a theater and once it's over it's done and everyone totally. had this shared experience from the one theater, moment. and that and that is an that is like it's like a concert. It's the coolest thing ever. Totally, yeah. Um, the, you know the way, as far as the actual performing it, it's different. You know, you have to kind of use different muscles, mm -hmm. but um, it's very, it's it's very gratifying and cool to 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 do it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the the difference is, I remember one time an acting teacher once told me, one of my, uh, this great acting t teacher I had named Diana Stevenson. Mm -hmm. um, she said, you know, I've often thought about the differences between acting in front, uh, on a stage versus a, a camera. And the way she kind of described it, she said, I sometimes think that, you know, you have to get in touch with all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of picture this feeling going through your body when you're on stage, mm. your gestures and your voice has to be it has to be loud enough so that the back row can hear sure. it. So everything's a little bit heightened. And when you're in front of a camera, imagine all that stuff still going through your body, but your face uh. is a sponge. So you're soaking up all of that feeling, Before all of that it. emotion, but you're not okay. kicking it out to the back oh, okay. row of a theater. You're letting your face kind of soak it in. Interesting. And a camera will pick that up. Mm -hmm. And so modulating those two styles is... Uh, cool. Is, uh, it can be thrilling and it can be challenging when you're going from one to the other yeah to uh, retrain your brain rapidly a because yeah yeah there were several times in my career where i was doing a play and then i went right into a film and usually that first week the director oh. of the film was always saying just bring it down a little really? bit just bring it down and then huh. oftentimes i went right into a play after uh, a movie and they said a little bit more, more just bring it back. up yeah yeah wow. so um you know, I like the sponge image. It's it's helpful. It was a way. I think sometimes actors have at, yeah the, uh, asked that question. What's the difference yeah. between working on you know on, on stage and in front of a camera? And it's just yeah, a camera picks up everything. Mm -hmm. It's all eyes. You know, your eyes. Mm. Your eyes uh, hmm. can tell. It can do a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah, interesting. You can create something very powerful, but it's but stillness really is you know, yeah yeah the the way to go. I think in both. <laughs> Totally. Stillness and timing. Ti timing and st those are the kinds of things that take practice, that take experience, right? It, it takes relaxation. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I, th I think. Yeah. And hmm. one of the things that doing a play and doing it eight times a week uh, forces you to do is relax. Because... Okay. And when I, well, I guess when I say uh, relax, it's not like you are relaxed doing it. But mm -hmm. uh, your concentration gets better, but it gets a little easier. And you breathe a little bit easier be just because you've done it now right. so many times. And so you okay. can get a little focused. But it doesn't... I think people's... I think the best work people tend to do is when they are the most... Uh, mm. Concentrating comes easily. They're breathing. Mm -hmm. And there's... Uh, 
there's a, a focus, but mm-hmm. not a there's not there isn't something manic going on or desperate. Yeah, Mm-mm. it has a lot to do with confidence, right? Relaxation, almost. Well, I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean, confidence and and you get confidence. Do people say this about plays and doing it so many times? You get confidence mm-hmm. because you do you do it over and over again, right? And some of that mystery starts to make sense. You learn. You just do it over and over again, and so sure. you gain confidence. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what I. I that makes sense. Yeah, no, that it makes... does, right? I mean, right. <laughs> well, we're always asking about audition advice too. I'm wondering uh-huh. if you have like your. Do you have a go-to piece of audition advice, especially in terms of like, yeah, how do you walk into a room and and achieve that relaxed like I, as if you've done it a hundred times before? I I know this that when I first started auditioning, and I get a, I got some commercial auditions. I had this real junky car, mm-hmm. and one time I was driving to the audition and I. I, you know, something in, in the chassis, something underneath my car just fell out in the middle of the road. Okay. <laughs> to get it. And then I went to this audition. I thought, well, this, uh, I don't know if my car can run without this. Um, <laughs> okay. And I went to the audition and I was with some other person and they asked us questions. They said, what have you been up to? And the guy said, well, I did this commercial. I did this job. This is what I've been up to. I auditioned for this. Uh, and then they said, what about you? What have you been up to? And I said, well, I was just at this intersection <laughs> and this part of my car fell in the middle of the road and I drove it here, but I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm supposed to be driving this. I didn't hear I, what I definitely didn't do huh. was talk about a job that I had right. or something I auditioned for. And I didn't make it about acting. Okay. And I think that I wound up getting that job. You booked the job. I booked the job. And wow. so when, when um, in those auditions, I would sometimes hear people that get asked questions. Yeah. And I remember thinking, these people are from Chicago working for an ad firm. or They, they, they don't care about what, <laughs> the career. what you just worked on. Totally. They want to yeah, yeah, know yeah. who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. The hustle, yeah. Yeah. Don't try and, imp- we don't need to try and impress anybody. Right, be relatable, especially sure, sure. In, in in commercials. Gotcha. But um, but yeah. that really did just had just happened to me, and I was yeah. Told, I, on your I mind. knew it was ridiculous. That I'm like, <laughs> that why am I driving that. this? This thing. I don't. Th- I think. <laughs> I think I need to call the garage. Uh huh. Um, but so you answered honestly. I answered honestly, which is also like a key thing in a performance. Like, we want honesty. Well, I just. I, re- I don't think I would have given an answer about what I'd been working on anyway. I think I l- yeah. realized early on, don't try and Im- gotcha. Don't try and impress the yeah the casting directors. It's a desperation factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is good advice too. Yeah, I should ask yeah. you about living with yourself. It must have been a very fascinating process. This this project. It was. It was a first for me. For I sure. I mean, for most, uh, this is a very rare thing for most actors. You're off. You're acting opposite yourself. Right. Which for, I have to ask how 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 does it how does it work. Well, um, it was, f- for me, it was without another acting partner. Uh-huh. There's no, there's no one way to do it. And I know it's a convention people have seen before. And, um, mm-hmm. I found that for me, w- the way it worked best is imagining myself standing opposite me. Okay. And what I would do is, uh, record the lines for both characters oh. and then whatever character was driving the scene is the character that I would film first. Gotcha. Okay. And mm. there was somebody off camera and it had all of my cues, all the other lines synced in onto an iPad. And so when I would say my line on film, they would press a button and I would hear in the reply in, in, in an earpiece, oh. in an earpiece, yeah, and in a little earwig that I had in my ear. Wow. And so I heard my own voice, and I just okay. imagined where I was going to stand, and then huh. I would change over into the other character, and I would study what we had already filmed. Once we got a take that we liked, okay, I would You're look at, at where what I did, where I moved, what gestures, and all of that, and mm-hmm. on what words mm-hmm. I did it. And wow. then we would take a moment to really sync up where the eye lines would be. Mm-hmm. And then I would imagine yeah. what I had done. And 
I did it specifically because I didn't want to react to whatever the stand-in was doing because mm-hmm. y- no matter what you're yeah. reacting, you know, you're acting is reacting. So you're going to react to whatever is, whatever is going on in, yeah. in front of me. Yeah, and yeah. part of the appeal in doing this job was trying to be the architect of a scene in a way I've never been before hmm. where I get to build a scene, take it to a certain place, know how I want it to sound, what, how I want to, you know, hit certain jokes and setups and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. And I got to do it. It, it never works that way. Cause you're usually, you know, you were working with whatever anybody else is doing is going to change the direction of it to, at least in some way. Yeah. So it was a cool experiment. Totally. It's way more responsibility in a way. It was, um, a lot of time. Sure. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like a really hard thing to get. Like, did you ever achieve the the theatery thing of like, I've got this down? Well, it got easier. Oh, it, it did. It, okay. it didn't. It got a little easier um, because I started to yeah, I started to learn as it went as we went along mm. uh, how to make my eyes look at make my eyes seem as if I'm looking at something four feet in front of me oh, wow. versus 20 feet in front of me. There's a wow. weird thing that with, with your eyes, you, if you and I right now, we are sitting across from each other. We're just a couple of feet apart. Mm-hmm. Now, if you were not there and I was pretending I was talking to you, sure. some people might put an X, a tape mark on the back of the wall. 20 feet away. 20 feet away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And... I could look at that X, which, you know, the eyes would be in the same line, but if it would, it would look like I'm looking 20 feet away. Okay. Wow. I started to be able to kind of snap into looking three feet in front of me mm-hmm. with nothing there. Um, wow. I also learned how to start to um, not really improvise, but kind of embellish and get comfortable with acting opposite myself as the second character, because I'd already, okay. I'd already set the, the dialogue for the first one. And I remembered mm-hmm. things that I had done. I started getting more comfortable wow. so I could fill in some of the, uh, some of the setup, some of the quiet moments with something gotcha. to make yeah, yeah. this thing flow. There are a lot of a like quicker. interjections. It's just, you know, you, you do wow. it, you start to get into the zone a little bit. Yeah. It sounds really challenging. It was, but it was, it was a great, uh, it was a great exercise. It was really, it was, it was unlike anything I've ever done. And I I can't imagine doing anything quite like it again. Yeah. Well, is, was it also, did you, how much did it change throughout where your characters, did you get a sense of, um, I find it fascinating with TV. Your first impression of a character is not necessarily, you learn a lot about the character as you go in mm. TV. Mm-hmm. Is there something that you didn't know about both of these people that you didn't, or did it go somewhere you didn't expect? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, you, cause you imagine something in your mind and then when you're mm-hmm. actually doing it, it does it's different little nuances and things start to inform what it is that you're doing and mm. it starts to shift as you do it. But, um, it didn't feel so different than what I, imagined at first. And I think that was because the writing was so mm. good. It was very clear to me who these who they were. people were. Cool. Okay. But it, that does, that does happen. Yeah. If you ask anybody who does some long run or a movie or whatever it is, they finish. You they, never they, know. As soon as you're done, you think, okay, now I'm ready to do this thing. Cause Again. I feel like I got an idea of who, what, who this character is. <laughs> In the beginning. Is. Yeah, totally. And did you, uh, you must've done a lot of the physicality work of their voices are a little different too. Right. The one of them's got a little bit more of a clipped prim and proper voice. Well, there, you know, the challenge was making sure that they were uh similar enough that if people ran into one or the other, they wouldn't be suspicious. Okay. So it wasn't this extreme difference. Mm-hmm. And yet yeah. the differences had to be um pronounced enough that you knew which character was which yeah. if the even if the other one wasn't on screen. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And the so the audience has to be in the know. Right. On who's and in. so yeah, the yeah. first thing that and the directors, um, Dayton and Ferris, uh, and Tim Greenberg, the writer, like we talked about it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the physical 
manifestations that we could go to first were hair. I could do something a little different with my hair. Sure. Posture does a lot. Okay, yeah. Uh, clothes mm. do a lot. Mm. And then um, there were other little things that I would do. I felt like I was playing two very different characters. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, with the clothes on the old version of the character, everything was just a little frumpier. I always m- would miss a belt loop. Oh, okay. Uh, even That's if nobody cool. ever saw it, I, I just... Yeah, that, that totally I, helped you. It, it, you. Whether it helped me or not, I don't know, but I thought it was funny. Okay. <laughs> That's as <laughs> good a reason as any. And, and over time, those little things, they actually do kind of help. Yeah. They do play a part. Um, oh, you know, the, the new version of the character was always put together. Uh-huh. Until he becomes, maybe until he's not so put together. Yeah. But, it, but um, you know, all the clothes fit a little better. Hair was was a little nicer. Higher. Yeah. yeah. And um, and s- when you're doing that kind of thing uh, with posture and mm. clothes, you, you, you feel different inside. And on sub subconscious level, I think gotcha. certain differences start to occur maybe even without me knowing but mm-hmm. um but wow. we made you know a lot of really specific choices you know, like um i don't want to smile i don't think the old version smiles uh, you ever know, that kind of yeah, thing yeah, yeah yeah and uh and if i'm smiling let's cut oh wow uh yeah. so um and very collaborative in terms of very much so yeah yeah and i, I it sounds like you've never ever watched yourself more on camera for a project well, this be. one was, yeah, it, it it became, I had to. Yeah. And if you're studying whether your eyes are looking three feet or 20 feet ahead. Well, we didn't want to do the thing where you have a single on one character, then all of a sudden it turns around, it's a single on another character <laughs> on the other guy. Um, that's not really that interesting. We thought it would be great if we could see both characters all in the, the same time. frame. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually one shot that is almost three minutes long, and it's a one of both characters wow. in the in the frame mm. that were moving all around a room. And that took uh, wow. a lot of choreography and a lot of yeah, yeah, work. Yeah. And a lot. I was studying it a lot, and I thought, okay, yeah, I, I'm. I'm I'm throwing something in the garbage on this line, and when I say that word, I am throwing a, a tissue in a trash in a trash can. So, when I was doing it on the other end, and I heard that word, I would move my eyes and knowing Crazy. what I had done. Yeah. So it did become choreography. It is like music, and you know, yeah. on the you're doing this move on this word on this, wow. you know, and, uh, and and some of it too. We were uh, moving so quickly. We didn't have the luxury of time. Okay. So mm-hmm. uh, I had to really study something quickly and then and look and watch wow. because I couldn't afford not to yeah. because, we, because we had more stuff to film. Hmm. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to somebody recently who said like it's because uh, you have a limited amount of time and sometimes because you have a limited amount of resources – that that's what causes you to really buckle down and really focus and maybe do like great work. Limited time and limited resources yeah. are often the best things that somebody can have. For it innovation. forces you to, you know, be creative in, yeah, in yeah. ways if you're filming something or shooting, you know, whatever it is and you don't have the money to do something, you have to think outside the box and yeah. that can be really interesting. Sure. And if you don't have time, you don't have time to get precious. Getting yeah. precious can really mess you up because <laughs> it can get in your head, right? You're you're overthinking. You're you're more inclined to like, or just constantly to refine. Just, yeah, and and be obsessed with perfection. Yes, and sometimes yeah. it, you can lose an urgency mm. when you have that kind of time. Yeah, and so it's yeah, cool. It's it was Dayton and Ferris, uh, Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris, the couple that uh, directed all of the episodes. Mm. And they're great directors. They first kind of uh, gained notoriety because they directed Little Miss Sunshine. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, they're great filmmakers. Hmm. And they are really uh, deliberate in what they do. They take a long time between films. They'd never worked on anything like so rapidly. And I think that was part gotcha. of the appeal for them, yeah. which was, uh, yeah, we don't have time on this one. Yeah. Let's see how that goes. Yeah. Wow. Are you always just, are you always challenging? Are you always looking for the new thing that's going to, you're not looking to settle into something familiar and you don't seem like the type to play it safe in your choices. I just think it'd be fun. It's always, 
I think everybody wants to work on stuff that seems interesting to them, at least at the time. And there are many other factors, but settling into something is just be punishment to me. I can't <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Routine can get like, we, we all need routines. The routine thing. Yes. But there are some routines that can be mind numbing. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I got to think about that. Cause that's the thing you want to establish a routine maybe until, maybe until the point that it becomes mind numbing and bad for you. Well, the routine, you know, Having a routine to, to provide really structure circle. in your day to allow yourself to kind of Get do done. some really daring things. Cool, cool. To, you know, and knowing that you have this mm. structure about your day. Yeah, uh, is that's the goal. Is the goal, but you know, we don't want our lives to be routine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because then the time will pass and you'll be dead. And if you're going to be cre- and creative, routine will kill creativity. Yeah, yeah, you got to shake things up, for yeah. sure, for sure. I have to ask you these silly questions. We call it the backstage five. I love it. Are you ready? Oh my god, I'm so ready. <laughs> How did you get your <laughs> SAG card? I uh, got hired to do a commercial for a th- for a beer. And oh, it was a. I think it was it was a it was Miller Light. I think it was a light beer, but it was a test product. And it oh, never even product. aired, but it was a product, and uh, but commer- it was through a commercial. Amazing. Yeah. And then you you did many more commercials. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Until Sisters, which uh-huh. I guess could be considered the big break, quote unquote. That was the first. Or... That was the first job that was a real acting job. Mm-hmm. I had done some commercials, um, but my first, and I had done I I done a school film. I did a USC mm-hmm. film, and I had done. A couple of uh, industrials, you know, for um, yes, but but f- a television sh- like a an actual acting job. Yeah. Uh, that was the first one. Yeah, yeah, on the show Sisters. Cool. Um, what is a performance every actor should see, and why? Ooh, uh, I think every actor should see the performance that Timothy Spall gives <clears throat> in Secrets oh. and Lies, and. Ooh. Uh, the reason is he, he he's such a great actor. Yeah. Um and it's a great film. Mike Lee, it's a masterpiece. There are performances Brenda Blethyn is in that film and she's mm. amazing and she got a lot of attention for it and Timothy Spall almost recedes in the shadows a little bit in that film. Uh-huh. And I love Timothy Spall, and I remember seeing that movie in the theater and thinking, he doesn't seem to be doing much. Mm, mm -hmm. And throughout the whole film, he was so restrained Mm -hmm. that I I just kind of wonder, what is it? I mean, is he phoning it in? What's happening? Mm. It doesn't seem like it didn't, it wasn't really showy in a way. Mm -hmm. And then late in the film, he has a moment Ah. where the veneer, everything cracks, and Mm. all of a sudden... To me, anyway, everything that he had done up to that made so much sense. Cool. And I looked at it as a performance that is worth studying because it's a, he, there's a trust there. He's trusting mm-hmm. that what he's trying to accomplish is working. Mm-hmm. Because as soon as he has this moment, I burst into tears. It really yeah. it nailed me in the chest. Mm-hmm. And I thought, my God, what an incredible... What an incredible performance uh, and one of restraint. Yeah, that ability to play subtext as like, it's almost like a magic trick pulling that off. Yeah, it's, well, it's, there were, there just, there weren't, it didn't seem like there were any tricks. Ah. Uh-huh. And I love big show, showy performances. Yeah. I, the anchormans of the. I mean, yeah. I, look, there are. <laughs> You know, there are so many incredible performances where people yeah. are doing such transformations and it's mm-hmm. and they are acting up a storm. Yes. But <laughs> my favorite stuff yeah. is the stuff where people don't seem like they are acting. Okay. And yeah. if you can get lulled into something and then all of a sudden they make a turn yeah. and the Perf- you and their performance has such depth and and has 
I, I just find it really effective. And that's, that's my favorite kind of acting, cool. honestly. Yeah, that's such a great, <laughs> such an interesting choice. <laughs> Because I've asked that question a lot and no one's ever said Timothy Spall no, or anything I, along the lines I, of, I feel like people more pick the big acting, the he, most acting. Uh, right. That's... Which is, yeah. Which is great and fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's fun to see people, you know, I can't believe that person is mm. that. I mean, th- look at their limp and their accent yeah. and their, uh, wanna, and that wig and their... Name specific uh, they, examples? You know, <laughs> no, I mean, no, no. I mean, but there's, look, there's... No, yeah. there's and I love it as much as anybody else, yeah. but I don't find that to be as That's impressive to yeah, me. Yeah. I mean, it's just not as impressive as yeah. um, the kind of the quieter, maybe a little more understated kinds of performances that most people would see and not even realize how good that really mm-hmm. is. Yeah. That's my favorite kind of yeah, actor. Yeah, yeah. That's my favorite kind of stuff. The subconscious stuff. Stuff that burrows uh, into Real you. in a way that, yeah. 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 Um, do you have a worst audition horror story? Oh God, I've got several. So but many. yeah, the first one <laughs> that is was, was one of my very first auditions. Uh huh. I had heard this story that when um, Danny DeVito won the role of Louis De Palma in Taxi, mm-hmm. it was because he stormed into the uh, network office and threw down the script and said, "Who wrote this?" And he stood on a table and he was screaming at all the executives, and they they were so. I uh, thought it was so funny and daring, <gasps> and that's how he got the part. Oh. And so I thought that's how you need to audition. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. And I got a job to audition for this kind of punk kid, and I went into the audition, and I was rude to everybody, and uh, <laughs> and I had a cigarette. Um, it wasn't lit, but it was my prop for the audition. Okay. And I was so into the audition that I remember I, I threw the cigarette down and s- kind of snuffed it out with my foot. Uh-huh. And as soon as it was, as it was over, I knew it wasn't going well, but uh, uh, they kind of said, well, all right, thank you. And I was driving home from that audition, and all I could think about was the... Um, poor assistant picking tobacco out of the carpet. Oh, no. Oh, the carpet. <laughs> yes. And, I, and oh, I, no. I thought, oh, my God, that was terrible. Why didn't I just go in and, and act the part? Right. You know, but I remember the my manager at the time says, hey, you know, you learn. <laughs> you learn. <laughs> at least you made a choice. Yeah. I made a choice. I made a really bad choice, and I, sure. I didn't do it again after You're that. You're going to learn from yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think we've learned, I think I've learned a lot. I think <laughs> listeners have learned a lot from you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank I wish you. I could sit and talk all day. This is great. In the Envelope, an awards podcast, is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rose Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to podcast producer extraordinaire Jamie Muffet and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.